Hello and welcome. Today we're going to take a look at the retrieval process. Once we've gotten that information into our long-term memory, how do we get it back out again? We're going to be talking about some different tips and tricks that hopefully you can use that will help facilitate retrieval in your day-to-day -day life. But you may be wondering why you still can't remember some information even though you know you were exposed to it or learned it. And part of that has to do with how quickly we actually do forget information. Herman Ebbinghaus did an experiment that demonstrated how quickly information fades from our memory. He presented subjects with a series of nonsense syllables and asked them to, to learn them and then to remember them. And in the recall process, he tested them at various intervals. What he found was that memory loss happens very, very quickly. Within the first 20 minutes, we already start to forget a great deal of the information that was presented to us, especially if we don't do anything with that information. We lose the majority of the information that we've been exposed to in the first nine hours, and then at about the 24 hour mark, that finally starts to level off. And whatever we remember, we typically remember for a long period of time. And this is true in a variety of contexts, not just with those nonsense syllables that he used. If you don't use information for a long period of time, say you learn a language in school, but then you never have to use it in your day-to-day -day life. Years go by and then you may decide to visit a country in which that language is spoken. When you try to use that information that you learned in school to help communicate and use that language, you might realize that you forgot a lot of information, but there are some things that you still remember even though you haven't used it in years and years. And that's what Herman Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve shows us, that whatever we seem to hold on to seems to stay in our memory for a very long period of time. And though it might decay a little bit as we continue to progress into our future, most of what we remember won't go away. There are some things we can do though to increase what we remember so that forgetting curve isn't quite as steep. For example, after we've already forgotten information, the next time we're exposed to it, we'll actually remember it faster and easier each time around. And if you remember in our last video, we talked about long-term potentiation and these neural networks that form in our brain. And every time you learn something new, a new connection is formed. When you learn something new, but then you never use it, that neural connection is going to become weaker, but it doesn't disappear entirely. So the next time you revisit that information, you relearn that information, or you practice that information, that connection is going to come back to life, so to speak, and it's going to show up faster than it did the first time you actually had to learn it. And that is referred to as savings. So the information is sort of saved in your memory. The imprint of the neural network is saved in your memory so that the next time you revisit or try and bring that information back, the next time you relearn it, it's going to happen faster than it did initially. And then as we talk about long-term potentiation, the more you continuously rehearse it, or we refer to that as overlearning, the stronger that connection becomes, and that's going to increase that retention. And so that's going to help keep those memories more permanent in your mind. There are other things that we can do to help aid in recall as well. And one of them is known as priming. And priming, if you think about it, if you've heard of priming before, you might think of it in the context of priming an engine. I have to prime the engine of my lawnmower before I can get it to start, for example. Priming is essentially warming up an area of your brain. It's activating those associations, this web of associations that we have in our mind to help facilitate in recall. The more that area is primed and warmed up, the faster retrieval is going to be. So say for example, you meet someone at an event and weeks go by, you see them again and you can't remember their name. Something you might do to help facilitate in that retrieval is think about everything else from that day. The location, the other people that were around, what you were wearing, anything you remember seeing or experiencing, and that might actually help trigger the memory of that person's name so that you can retrieve it from your long-term memory. All of that information from that event is 
in what is known as a schema or a conceptual set. Schemas are essentially categories that we have in our brain. You can think of them as different webs of association or different filing systems of all related concepts, terms, ideas, images that are related to the same subject. So the event that you are at, everything that you experienced, all goes into that schema. You might have a schema for, say, Italian restaurants, what they look like, the types of tablecloths, the types of food on the menu, all of that goes into your schema of Italian restaurants. And so we can use this priming of these specific schemas, these specific areas of our brain to help facilitate in recall or retrieval. This is helpful to us when it comes to, say, academics, because we can actually prime our brains before taking an exam. So the next time you sit down to take an assessment, one of the best things you can do is look over the information right before the assessment begins. Well, it's not gonna help you remember anything new or learn anything new in say the two or three minutes before the assessment starts. What it will do is it will activate these association areas in your brain. It will trigger recall that will make the retrieval of that information faster and easier for you. There are a couple other things that we can also do to help facilitate retrieval and make it faster and easier. And these are known as context effects. Context effects tells us that when we're in the same location, emotional state, or state of mind, that we are going to remember more information from the last time we were in that same place. So with setting, for example, you're more likely to remember information when you're in the same place as you were when you first learned it. Again, when it comes to academics, that's why it's important to, say, study at a desk as opposed to studying in your bed. Because when you sit down to take an assessment, you're more likely to do so at a desk. And so when the information comes into your mind, when you are learning that information, if you are sitting at a desk, when you study that information, and then when you retrieve that information, you're all in the same or at least a similar setting, you're gonna be more likely to remember the information that was presented to you when you were in that same place. Mood congruent memory is another type of context effect that looks at the emotional state that we're in. We're more likely to remember information when we're in the same emotional state as when that information was first encoded into our memory. When we're having a bad day, for example, we're more likely to remember all of the other bad days that we've experienced because we're in the same mood as we were when we had those previous bad days. When we're in a good mood, we're more likely to remember all of the happier times in our life. And again, in an academic setting, if we were calm when we learned the information, but stressed out when taking an assessment, it might actually hinder the retrieval of that information from our long-term memory. And that's why things like testing anxiety is a real thing, because when you are very nervous or worried about an assessment that you're taking, it can actually block the retrieval of information from your long-term memory. So trying to find ways to stay in the same emotional state can actually help facilitate the retrieval process. And the last one is called state-dependent memory. And state-dependent memory doesn't look at state as in, I'm in the state of Illinois, but what state of consciousness or altered states of state of consciousness were you under that helps you to facilitate retrieval. So for example, and hopefully this doesn't apply to any of us, but when you are under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you're more likely to remember information from the last time you were in that altered state of consciousness. We see this in studies of people who consume alcohol and then do something such as hiding their keys, and then later they can no longer remember where they hid them. The next time they are under the influence, all of a sudden they can remember where they hid their keys again. So that is what state-dependent memory is. So there are a lot of things that we can do to help facilitate the retrieval or recall of information. Obviously, the first step is making sure that information makes its way into our, our long-term memory. So doing things that are actually going to move information into our long-term memory, such as long-term potentiation, the levels of processing theory, overlearning, all of this is the first step to actually getting information into our long-term memory. But then in order to pull it back out again, we can use these different tips such as priming and context effects to help make sure that we can pull out as much information as possible when we need to. 
there still isn't foolproof. And the next time we meet, we're going to go ahead and talk about forgetting and all of the different ways that happens. Our memory isn't perfect, but it is pretty fantastic once we learn all of the different ways we can use it to make it more effective in our day-to-day -day lives. Thanks for watching, and remember, be kind to your mind.